Persistence also means doing hard things when it's time to do them, which means you have to be able to feel your feelings. You have to be able to face what's hard and what hurts, what's uncomfortable, what's uncertain. You have to do your deeper healing work so that that doesn't trip you up and stop you. That is persistence. If you're not persistent, you won't do hard things. If you don't do hard things, you can't be persistent. Hey friends, welcome to episode 11 of the Make It Inevitable podcast. I am your host, Stephanie Zamora, and today I want to talk about persistence and doing hard things. If you follow me, especially on Instagram, you may already know that I lost both of my cats over the holiday break. The younger one passed very suddenly and very unexpectedly, and five days later, the older one passed, and he had already been declining from liver and kidney disease, but he declined very rapidly. And I certainly did not expect to lose both of them so quickly, so suddenly, and so soon apart. And that was a really difficult experience. And I have done a lot of hard things in my life and still having done them, having done this healing and growth work, understanding how to do hard things throughout each of those losses and all of the things that we have to do in the aftermath of loss, there were a lot of times that I would stop and think to myself, I don't know how to do this. I don't know how to do this. I don't know how to walk through this. I don't know how to make this decision. I don't know how to let them go. I don't know how to go home. I don't know how to do the things I needed to do after their passing. And when it comes to doing hard things, I feel that's a very common thought. I don't know how to do this. It feels impossibly overwhelming. Otherwise, we wouldn't call it a hard thing. It would be an easy thing, an easeful thing, a thing we know how to do, a thing that we can do, a thing that we feel confident enough to do. So doing hard things initially brings up a lot of doubt. And it did for me, even having done a lot of hard things over the last eight years, I would have that thought, I don't know how to do this. But because I have built a muscle around doing hard things and I have built trust in myself and I really understand the process of what it takes to do hard things, whether we're trying to make something in exciting and impossible come to life or we're walking through trauma and grief and loss and challenging chapters, I have built a muscle around that by doing the hard things. And I have built a lot of trust in myself from continuing to show up and do hard things. And so I would think that thought, I don't know how to do this. And it would be immediately followed with, yes, you do. You just do it. You just do it. You just walk through it. You just take the next breath and the next step. And then you do that again and again and again until you are on the other side of it and you feel your feelings and you break down and you cry. You do what you need to do as you take those steps. But the only way through hard things is to walk through it. And that's really, really difficult. And no matter how many times we do hard things, there can be more ease in it and that we are not in resistance to doing it because we understand that we have to do it. If we want to get to the other side, we have to go through the hard thing. We have to take the hard steps, make the hard decisions and fumble and cry and scream our way through them. There is no other way of doing hard things. So there becomes more ease because we're not in resistance. I'm not fighting against what is happening as it's happening. I'm simply struggling my way through it. I'm feeling my way through it. I'm doing the best that I can each moment of it. I'm breathing. I'm taking the next step. I'm, I'm asking for help and support. I'm resting when I need to, but I'm moving through it actively. And the more that we do that, the more trust that we have in ourselves because we know that we can do hard things. We've done them before. We've survived them before. And so there's less tension and resistance. There's less fighting against it, fighting against ourself and our experience and our feelings. So there's more ease. But doing hard things doesn't necessarily become easier. It doesn't become something that's fun, that we look forward to, that we're glad we get to do. So there's still emotions. There's still resistances, especially when it's a new hard thing that we've never walked through before, that we've never experienced, especially when it's sudden or traumatic or heavy with grief and uncertainty and confusion and fear. If our trauma gets triggered, doing hard things doesn't necessarily become easier. It can be more easeful. And that we're not in resistance, but it's not easier. And no matter how many times we've done hard things, it doesn't mean that we know how to do this one that's right in front of us. I've lost pets before. 
in different ways, but I've never lost pets that I've had for years and years and years. I've never had to make decisions about when to let them go. I've never had one pass away suddenly and unexpectedly in a way that was very jarring to my heart, my soul, my nervous system. I've never done that before. So it makes sense that in doing it, in it happening and me walking through it, that I would have those thoughts of, I don't know how to do this. Never done it before. And even if I had done it before, that wouldn't make doing it again easier. It just makes it more easeful because we have experience under our belt and we know that we can do it. So I just really want to hammer that home that doing hard things is hard. It's difficult. It's challenging. And I really want to give credit where credit is due. I am a big fan of Glennon Doyle, and she is the one who has really coined and and put out the phrase of, we can do hard things. And she has a podcast that's all about doing hard things, and she writes all the time and speaks all the time about doing hard things. Her work is amazing. Definitely check it out. And I love this idea, this concept, this phrase of, we can do hard things. And I think we need to talk more about what that looks like. Because it is not just about being gung-ho, like, yes, we can do hard things, rally cry, let's do it. You actually have to do it. You actually have to move yourself through it. And, And that's hard because it's a hard thing. That's hard because not only is it a hard thing that we have to navigate through, but it is heartbreaking, traumatic, unsettling. So there's a lot that we go through in the process of facing and moving hard things. And if we're not resourced, if we're not skilled, if we don't understand our subconscious programming, our winning strategies, our deep rooted fears, our trauma triggers, all of these things about ourselves, then we go into doing hard things with a certain level of resistance. If I had not processed and healed my trauma around sudden loss from eight years ago, I may have handled this completely differently. It may have looked a lot more challenging. There might've been a lot more fight and resistance, a lot heavier, weightier, longer lasting grief. And, you know, we can't know that for sure. We can't know that healing certain traumas and grief and old wounds and things like that will necessarily change how we respond to things in the future because each loss is different. Each loss is individual. It's a different experience with a different history, a different context. And... When we have done our deeper healing work, then we at least know that we can face into whatever is right in front of us without all of the coloring, the baggage, the influence of the past. So I can face the sudden loss and this traumatic experience and this big, heavy grief for what it is, not what it is plus unprocessed grief and trauma for my first big, sudden loss. Again, that creates more ease. It doesn't make it easier. It doesn't make it less difficult or it doesn't cause me to feel less grief and devastation. I still have to go through the process of grieving, of seeing how the trauma affects me and what needs to be healed and cleared from there. There's still a process with every hard thing, with every loss, with every trauma. But at least I'm just facing this. I'm just facing this right now. I just get to be present with what I feel about this experience. And yes, it will bring things up from the past. I will connect dots with how I'm feeling now and how I felt in the past. I had a lot of anxiety in that first week after I lost both my boys. That same feeling of wanting to crawl out of my own skin while screaming at the top of my lungs. And so that reminds me of my first loss. And that brings some of that up. But I'm not walking into this sudden, traumatic, grief-stricken experience with all the baggage of the old. I'm able to face what's in front of me and really move through it step by step, really be present with it. So doing the deeper healing work helps create more ease around the future hard things that we do because now we're not in resistance because of all this past trauma, these fears. The grief isn't heavier because we haven't grieved something from the past. So we have to process our feelings. And when we're doing the hard things, we have to let ourselves feel what we feel as we feel it, as we move through it. So me doing these hard things was messy, really, really messy. There were a lot of experiences 
with other people, whether that was family or dealing with the vet's office or making phone calls, whatever it was where I was sobbing my way through it, or my voice was cracking, my whole body was shaking, I felt nauseous and dizzy, I had a pit in my stomach and my throat, or I couldn't think clearly. It wasn't like I'm going to center myself and get myself in the right place so that I can go through this hard thing and it looks, I look good and strong and I don't cry. It was messy. It's ugly. I sobbed when both my boys passed. I sobbed walking out of the vet's office trying to have a conversation about what happens next with them. What do I want to do? What are the decisions I need to make? Asking questions, getting the clarity that I needed. It was messy. Sometimes I was calmer, but a lot of times I was sobbing, shaking, disoriented, feeling nauseous, having to pause, having to make changes with rescheduling phone calls, moving projects that I could move. It was messy, but I did it one step at a time, one decision at a time. And here's the thing about doing hard things that are really abrupt and sudden and overwhelming which a lot of them are, even if it doesn't involve loss or trauma, there's an overwhelm. There's a sense of uncertainty. There is a shifting that happens in our foundation. And when the ground shifts beneath us, our center of gravity shifts with it. It can be very disorienting. We talk a lot about this in journey mapping, navigating through challenging chapters and big life transitions. There is a shift in our foundation, our center of gravity. Suddenly everything about existing in the world feels and is completely different. There's a lot that happens. There's a lot that's disorienting and challenging. There's a lot of emotion that's suddenly present in our body, a lot of thought. And if we haven't done that deeper work, if we're not aware of our core wounding or we're still carrying the baggage of old grief and trauma, there's a lot of story spiraling around in our heads. So we have to slow down. We have to give ourselves permission to slow down. There are some things that we can't slow down. Some things just move very quickly. Decisions must be made. Things happen without our say, our desire, our choice. So we can't slow everything down, but we slow down as much as we can. Because when we're triggered, when we're grieving, when we're angry, when we're sad, when our emotions are heightened, it's very difficult for our brain to make logical, rational decisions, to feel grounded and centered in ourselves enough so that we can tap into what feels right and true for me. So we slow down when and where we can, when we're doing hard things. We rest, we take space. We don't make decisions that we don't have to make right away. And if we think we have to, we ask, can I have more time? Well, granted, some of these things are really hard for us to access in the moment. So we give ourselves grace. If we do rush through things and make the wrong decision, we do the best we can and we give ourselves grace because we're going through a lot. And if you have stories about yourself not being good enough or being a failure or whatever it might be, you're not going to give yourself as much grace. All of this deeper healing work matters. It gives us this foundation to walk through situations differently. There wasn't a single why me, why my boys. Not one. There was a lot of people saying to me, this is so unfair. And I appreciated that. And I understood where it came from. And there were times that I said, yeah, it is. But at no point in walking through this, did I think that thought myself? Did I think, why me? Why this timing? Why my boys? This is so unfair. The universe is out to get me. Life doesn't support me. Nothing ever goes my way. There were no stories There was just what was happening as it was happening and the feelings that came with it. There was only what was happening as it was happening and the feelings and emotions that came with it. It sucked that it happened the way that it happened, when it happened, how it happened, where it happened, that it was me, that it was my boys, all of it really sucked. And I'm really still very sad about it. But there was no story There was no resistance to what was happening. There was no fighting against it. There's no tension. There's no wounding that got triggered. There were old traumas that I was reminded of, but they weren't activated. There's old grief that I was reminded of, but it wasn't present. 
I was able to be in each moment of this experience, which gave me far more leverage to make the decisions that were right for me, to ask the questions that I needed to ask so that I wouldn't wonder about them for long periods of time, so that I wouldn't spiral on the what ifs or was it this, was it that, so that I would have all the information that I needed so I could grieve properly, so I could make decisions that were best for me. I asked for more time to make the decisions that there was a possibility for more time around. I asked for and accepted help. I gave myself space. I created space. I moved calls. I moved projects. I did what I could. That would have been really difficult if I hadn't healed from sudden loss and traumas in the past. And whatever hard thing I go through next, should I ever have to walk through a sudden and traumatic loss? I will definitely have to walk through more loss. I'm human. In the human realm, loss is happening all the time. Sudden and traumatic loss, I have to walk through that again. I will be more resourced and leveraged. I will have more space. More of me will be present for the experience. There will be more ease because I won't be bringing the baggage of this forward. I might feel more sad. It might remind me of this loss and the losses before it, but it won't spiral me into story. It won't add layers of unresolved and unprocessed grief and trauma on top of what I have to walk through. And in order to do that, we have to be present with what we're going through and we have to give ourselves permission and space to feel everything that we feel, to express everything that needs to be expressed in real time as it happens. There were times that I had to regulate my nervous system to breathe and, and try to slow the outpouring of emotion down just so I could speak, just so I could make decisions, just so I could drive the time that I was alone. So having skills to slow ourselves down, to regulate our emotions and our nervous system, to be able to make decisions and think a little bit more clearly, it doesn't mean that we're bypassing our experience. These are all skills. These are emotional intelligence skills, the ability to feel and process without story the ability to regulate our nervous system in the midst of a lot of intense emotion. These are all skills that I have cultivated, that I have developed, that I know when and how to use without bypassing what I'm feeling. We can't do hard things if we are unwilling to feel what's challenging, difficult, uncomfortable. If we're unwilling to sit in uncertainty, to navigate our way through that, to face the many unknowns that come with hard things. We can't do them. We won't actually do them. We will seek to bypass, to avoid, to stuff down. We might get ourselves through to the other side of something, but we won't be free and clear of it. We'll still be carrying everything that was unfelt, unprocessed, unresolved in our bodies, in our cells, in our tissues, in our bones. That will resurface one way or another. And the next time that we're faced with a hard thing, it's going to be even more difficult to navigate our way through it. We have to feel what's here. We have to do it productively. We have to do it cleanly and thoroughly. No bypassing, no avoiding. We have to be willing to sit in uncertainty and discomfort and face unknowns. To surrender to the unfolding of things. I never could have gotten through these two losses back to back, had I not been willing to surrender to the unfolding, to move with what was right in front of me as it showed up. There was no other way to do it. There was no controlling this. There was no certainty. There were a lot of unknowns, a lot of really difficult decisions. I had to take it step by step. We can't do that if we're afraid of uncertainty, of discomfort. We can't do hard things if we're not willing to feel our grief, our anger, our sadness are upset, are hurt. So if you really want to be able to do hard things, you have to build your emotional intelligence, your ability to sit with and feel your emotions fully, productively, cleanly, thoroughly in a way that processes them out as they come up. And yes, sometimes we need to regulate our nervous system. We need to breathe and slow it down and stop crying for long enough to speak our words. And we need to let ourselves cry as much as is needed, as much as is present in our body, as much as wants to come through in the moment. 
It's a dance. It's a balance. But we don't bypass. So if you're facing a hard thing, a challenging chapter, a big life transition, trauma, loss, and you are unwilling to feel certain emotions, you cannot do the hard thing in front of you. Even if it seems like you have, you are still lugging around a whole lot of baggage from it. You have to be able to feel your feelings, to face things that are uncomfortable, to face and feel what's hard and what hurts, even when you think it might consume you. You have to let yourself grieve, process, experience all of the discomfort that comes with doing hard things. And in doing this, you will learn that you can survive it. Just like navigating a terror barrier. We talked all about the terror barrier in an earlier episode. We'll link to that in the show notes. It's very relevant here. It's very similar. You're resisting something because you don't think you can handle it, that you can survive it that you are capable of feeling it or navigating it or experiencing it or seeing it, whatever it is. You're in resistance to it because you don't think you can survive it. And with all big emotions that come with loss and trauma and challenging chapters and big life transitions, doing hard things, the emotions will feel very big because there are, and there will be a lot of them. And if you haven't done your deeper healing and clearing work, there'll be a lot from the past that comes up too. And suddenly you're, you're overwhelmed with emotion and feelings and stories and wounds and triggers, discomfort, uncertainty. But I promise you, and I know this with certainty, no matter how big, how difficult the emotion is, you will survive it. You will actually be better for feeling it through and beyond the point that you think you cannot reach you are so certain will consume or kill you. You will survive it and you will be better for it. In the next episode, we're going to talk a lot about emotions because it's very relevant and emotions are critical to doing hard things, to making the impossible happen. You have to be able to feel and process your emotions. You have to be able to face what's hard and what hurts. You have to be able to walk into uncertainty, to surrender to the unfolding. You have to. It's a must. It's a requirement. It is the only way to really, truly, thoroughly do a hard thing and be better for it. Be free and clear of it. I also want to talk a bit about persistence. And in order to really do that, I want to give you the definition of persistence first. So persistence is defined as the firm or obstinate continuance in a course of action in spite of difficulty or opposition. The firm or obstinate continuance in a course of action in spite of difficulty or opposition, that is persistence. That is stubbornly staying in motion around what it is that you say you want and who you're here to be, regardless of circumstance. I had a conversation recently after my losses where I was talking about how I know that there is nothing that will pull me away from my purpose from what's important to me, from becoming who I'm here to be. And I know that because I have had plenty of good reasons to quit, to give up, to not persist around what's important to me, to not even stay connected to who I am and my purpose. I've had plenty of good reasons between loss, trauma, abuse, the way all of that impacted my finances, my business, my health, my relationships. I've had plenty of reasons to quit. And when it comes to persistence, I think the important angle to take with it is that you are persistent around your purpose. Because with persistence, I feel like it can get a little wonky. We think in order to be persistent, that we have to stay in motion no matter what, that we can't quit, that we can't give up. But here's the thing about that. There are a lot of times that we are persistent around things that are no longer aligned for us. Maybe never were. So it's not a good thing to be persistent when it's not something that's aligned for you. When you're doing something out of a sense of obligation or just because you said you would. This doesn't mean that it's okay for us to flake out on people, to not follow through on our commitments and our word, to be inconsistent or inconsiderate. But there are a lot of things that as we move towards them, as we are shaped by the people around us, the situations that we walk through, the times that we live in, that who we're here to be and how our purpose wishes to express itself, what we're called towards, what resonates for us, changes. 
And if you think that persistence means never changing your mind about something or quitting on something, then you're going to stay persistent around things that actually take you further and further away from who you're here to be, your purpose, your fullest expression, your contribution. That's not good. Persistence around your purpose, persistence around pursuing your fullest expression, your unique contribution to the world, what you feel called to do, be, create, that is what matters. That is how I am persistent. I have quit on a lot of things. I have let go of a lot of things that were once important to me, people, relationships, communities, but also aspects of self, the life that I thought I wanted to live, the goals that I held. Because what I am committed to, what I am persistent around is my purpose, my fullest expression, a fully aligned life. That is what I am persistent around. And persistence doesn't mean that we don't stop and rest, that we don't give ourselves breaks, that we never quit even around the things that we want to continue being persistent with. I have quit on my business so many times. It's part of the process. Allowing myself to feel frustration when it's there, to throw my hands up in the air because I'm tired, I'm burned out, I'm not doing the right work. Quitting has allowed me to be more persistent around the things that really matter. I have quit on my business so many times. I have been done, done. I don't want it anymore. I'm done. I have pulled all my websites and content down. That's a part of being persistent that we don't talk about. You will quit. You will need breaks. You will rest. You will change your mind. So persistence around our purpose, who we're here to be, the work we're here to do, the life we're here to live, that is what matters. And that evolves. The seed of who we are never changes, but how it expresses through us. The things we feel called to create, the relationships we feel called to be in, our work in the world, that all evolves as we are shaped by life, by other people, by experiences, by the times that we live in. Persistence around your fullest expression, around following what calls you, what feels truly aligned for you, that is what matters. That is the most important form of persistence. And it can look like quitting and giving up when things are frustrating, taking a break when things are hard, resting when you need to, reassessing and changing your mind, changing your path, changing your goal. That's not not being persistent. So it's more important to me that you're persistent around your purpose, which means being connected to the truth of who you are, being in full alignment, knowing yourself, Knowing what it is that you deeply desire, not what you think you should want, not what other people want for you, from you. Who are you here to be? What do you feel called to create? Are you persistent with that? And part of persistence is doing hard things when it's time to do them. I am so persistent, so much so that people comment on it all the time. My discipline, my persistence, despite the hard things that I go through. That is because I am connected to the truth of who I am, my purpose, my fullest expression. Because I'm willing to quit on things that no longer align for me so that I can stay persistent around what really matters. That is persistence. Persistence also means doing hard things when it's time to do them, which means you have to be able to feel your feelings. You have to be able to face what's hard and what hurts, what's uncomfortable, what's uncertain. You have to do your deeper healing work so that that doesn't trip you up and stop you. That is persistence. They go hand in hand. If you're not persistent, you won't do hard things. If you don't do hard things, you can't be persistent. They go hand in hand. You cannot have one without the other. But is your persistence around the right things? The things that are most aligned for you. You have to know yourself to be able to say yes to that. Persistence requires doing hard things. Doing hard things requires persistence, but your persistence must be around what matters to you or you won't feel compelled to stay in motion. And when you're not compelled to stay in motion, you're more likely to tell a story about it, which will reinforce your core wounding, your traumas, your stories, activate your winning strategy, and take you away from what it is that you really want. All of this stuff weaves together. Everything that I have shared with you up to this point is what helped me do some of the hardest things of my life over the last eight years and in the last few weeks. 
losing both my boys was awful. Absolutely devastating and heartbreaking. I am still trying to reorient inside my own life without them. But there is more ease because there is no resistance or tension or fighting against it. Because I am so persistent when it comes to living a life that's fully expressed and fully aligned. From living out my purpose, from doing my work in the world. Nothing has stopped me because of that persistence. The reason that I have done so many hard things that most people would quit on It's not because I have a superpower. It's because I'm persistent around my purpose. That is the difference. But to be persistent around your purpose, you have to know what it is. If you haven't checked out our Actualize program, I highly recommend it. It is all about alignment and purpose. Getting clear on who you're here to be and who you feel called to be, what you feel called to do and create, what it means for you to be fully expressed and fully aligned. We'll link to that in the show notes. Actualize check it out. It could be just what you need to have the persistence required to do the hard things that you're facing. Persistence around our purpose will pull us through these challenging chapters and big life transitions and traumas and losses. I never stopped being persistent even when I quit, even when I reassessed or gave up on things. When I took breaks, that was my persistence. Because my persistence is more than just, this is the end goal that I set when I was a different person five months ago, a year ago, 10 years ago. Persistence for me is around my purpose, my fullest expression. And having that allows it to evolve, allows me to evolve inside of it in relationship to it. Makes it more important for me to do the hard things as they come up so that I can stay persistent around what matters to me. That is persistence in doing hard things. You cannot have one without the other. That is what I have for you today. I hope that if you are navigating any hard things, that you are really doing the work to have the resources and leverage you need to move yourself through it. We will link to a variety of resources that will support you in the show notes. So please check that out. And like I said, in the next episode, I want to go into emotions, really how to have a relationship, a healthy, productive relationship to our emotions and to process through them in a way that gives us more freedom and leverage to do hard things, to be persistent to live our fullest expression and a life that's truly aligned for us. So stay tuned for that. I can't wait to share. 